Good afternoon, everybody. We'll get started here in just a minute. I see people are still entering the uh, program. Becky, how many do we have in so far? We have 30 participants. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started uh, then. Uh, be respectful of everybody's time as people continue to join the webinar. So today is the, uh, the third and final webinar for the Ohio Federal Research Network Round 6 informational session to uh, answer your questions, hopefully, uh, that you might have when it comes to our Round 6 solicitation. I'm uh, Mark Bartman. I'm uh, going to be your MC for today. For those uh, that uh, uh, may not have been part of the Ohio Federal Research Network previously, we also have uh, Karen Posey, who is part of the uh, Ohio Federal Research Network leadership team, along with Becky Mesher and Emma Warner, who are, are experts that can hopefully help you out if you have problems when it comes to asking questions or maybe your Zoom is not working correctly, you can feel free to direct message either one of them and they hopefully will be able to help you out. We also uh, might have, I don't see her since I don't have the list up right now, but Mary Margaret Evans may join us today. She's also a member of Parallax leadership team. And then we have a guest speaker uh, for today that'll be up in just a few minutes here. I wanted to, um, if you could, Becky, you can go to the next slide, just highlight though very briefly, um, today's webinar is really all about Q&A with our subject matter experts that are available from one of our federal partners to help answer any questions you might have about the areas of interest for the Ohio Federal Research Network Round 6. If there are general questions, uh, please feel free to ask those as well, and we will um, do our best to answer those questions. As you may or may not have seen, but this is being recorded. Um, the first two webinars were also recorded and are on the Ohio Federal Research Network's website. So if you uh, need to or would like to, feel free to go back and review either one of those recordings as well. The, um, the second recording uh, went into a little bit more detail from our federal partners where the subject matter experts spent a, a few minutes uh, on each of the areas of interest talking about what they felt were the important areas uh, for you all to focus on if you're going to send a, a proposal in for us to evaluate. So um, with that, let me go through real quickly just a uh, very brief update on uh, what OFRN is and, and uh, where we're at for round six. And then uh, we'll have our guest speaker, which is uh, Scott Korndike. He's the president of the Enter Entrepreneur Center in Dayton that uh, will talk just a little bit about how they may be able to help you out um, at some point along your journey. And then uh, we'll get into the Q&A portion. So next slide, please, Becky. So if you're new to the Ohio Federal Research Network, these are our federal partners that you see on the left side of the slide. And on the right side is a, just a list of the numbers of universities and colleges and businesses that so far have participated in the first five rounds that, uh, that have been funded by the state of Ohio through the Ohio Department of Higher Education uh, for a total of uh, 35 teams that have been funded. Next slide, please. So again, these are sort of hopefully by now just a reminder uh, for everybody that um, the project teams have to have at least, and these are minimums, I always, uh, we need to make sure everybody understands that because everybody always asks, well, can I have more than one industry partner? Yes, you can. These are minimums. You have to have at least one industry member on the team, and that role can be as the lead applicant or the collaborator. 
You have to have at least two colleges or universities that participate on the team. And the Air Force Institute of Technology is eligible to be one of those colleges or universities that participates um, for this. And then, of course, you have to have a federal partner or sponsor uh, for that. So if you're new to this program or you're new to um, the Department of Defense and working with uh, any of these federal partners that you see listed here, and, and just in case um, um, you're not used to maybe the acronyms, uh, it's uh, Air Force Research Lab, NASA Glenn Research Center, the Navy uh, Medical Research Unit in Dayton, and or the National Space Intelligence Center are the, the four acronyms that you see there. Um, any one of those can be a federal partner or sponsor for you for this particular program. You just need uh, to have somebody that is willing to, to have their name on your proposal. Doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to spend a huge amount of time participating in what you're doing, but that they believe that, that your proposal has some merit and that they are interested in being a sponsor for your proposal on that. Next slide, please. Um, one of the key areas, and we get into this pretty much on every round that we've done, is that this program is intended for applied research. So essentially, again, if you're familiar with the way DOD um, outlines the different types of science and technology activities, this would generally be considered as 6.2 or 6.3. Um, if you're more familiar maybe with uh, technology uh, readiness levels, um, then you could probably consider this to be something as a three or higher is primarily what we're looking for. Uh, the bottom line though, is that this is not intended for basic or foundational research and those types of proposals will not be accepted. Next slide. Uh, so just a couple of highlights, or maybe uh, I would say foot stompers, um, is that first of all, you need to make sure that your university or the universities that you're partnering with are aware that there will need to be a technology control plan completed, and that plan needs to be developed um, within 45 days of notice of the award. If we don't have that within 45 days of notice of the award, then I can guarantee that you're running the risk of uh, your proposal being dropped and we'll go to somebody else that can meet that requirement. For export control, um, again, just as a, a foot stomper, is that uh, these are uh, US, uh, these federal partners um, do primarily uh, look at utilizing individuals that are US persons or those that are eligible to obtain the necessary export license to participate in the project. So that is uh, important to understand. Next slide, please. Uh, so all of the things that are listed here on this slide are due April 28th, 2023. So that would be your entire proposal, which would consist of the technical proposal, which would be a maximum of eight pages, there's a supplement of two pages. There's a cost proposal, which would include your budget worksheet, the student experimental engagement attachment, which is a maximum of two pages, your vendor profile, uh, there's a quad chart, and then a, your TRL assessment. Uh, all of this is on the website. So if you have any questions and you haven't gone to the website previously to take a look at this, I would highly encourage you going to the website um, because you will find all of this information that you need there on the website under round six. Next slide, please. So here are the key dates. So today is being April the 17th. As I said, this is our last uh, informational session webinar. Yep. Uh, tomorrow uh, is the last day that questions will be accepted through the OFRN website. And uh, so at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon is the cutoff for questions to be accepted. Um, we will get those answers back out on the website as quickly as we possibly can because the solicitation is due by April the 28th at 5 p.m. So I'll say the same thing that you probably have heard if you have any, if you've ever been involved with any of the SBR, STTR program where you have to use the government's website to submit proposals is I would please not wait to the last minute till 4.59 on April the 28th to try to submit your proposal just in case something happens and the power goes out or the website goes down or something else takes place. So um, try to get your proposals in as early as you can, but 
In any case, the deadline is April the 28th by 5 p.m. Next slide, please. Uh, and this again is just sort of a reminder is that if uh, you need to uh, have some help putting together your team, then uh, please go to the Ohio Federal Research Network's website. There is a link to team matchmaking on there and you can advertise uh, exactly what it is that you need. So, you know, if you're an academic institution, you can advertise that you need a small business. Uh, if you're a small business, you can advertise that you need um, an academic institution to be able to work with you to be able to put a team together. I would, again, highly suggest that if you haven't done that yet and you don't have your team makeup complete, that you do that today as soon as we get done with this webinar. Next slide, please. So uh, let me introduce real quickly again, Scott Korndike, who's the president of the Entrepreneur Center in Dayton. And uh, he'd like to just provide a little bit of information on uh, what they do and how they can help you all as potential team members for the Ohio Photo Research Network. Scott, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Scott Korndike, president of the Entrepreneur Center. And let me begin by thanking Mark and Karen, Becky and Emma for just a few moments that we get to spend with you. I don't want to take any time away from the OFRN team, uh, but we have as a innovation support center been actively either directly or indirectly involved with the OFRN team really almost since the inception of OFRN. And we have such great respect for and admiration for the way that the OFRN team thinks about not only technology development, but commercialization. And we have an opportunity, we would like to at least express the opportunity to join your teams, if valuable to you, to really help you think about that key commercialization kind of question, the key commercialization uh, plan development. So the Entrepreneur Center, as I said, is a full service innovation support center. We have the pleasure of being in Dayton, Ohio. Um, so we are minutes and uh, moments away, really, from the Air Force Research Lab. So we work very closely with AFRL. We've developed over the course of the last seven or so years with AFRL a host of different projects that really go to this heart of commercialization and how to support commercialization. Uh, and so in putting our heads together with Mark and with Karen, um, we're hopeful that if you as a team and as team members need any assistance as you think about commercialization, uh, we want to at least offer that up. Now, we are one of five organizations across the state which run what are called entrepreneurial service provider programs. So each of you, wherever you are in the state, have the ability to seek out free, quote unquote, free services from partners just like us. And I would, I would encourage you to do that. But for more comprehensive projects like OFRN, where you're really looking to demonstrate your ability to move a technology kind of through those stages of development. And with commercialization being such an important part of that, we would love to join you on your teams. Now, what can we do? We really want to assist your commercialization efforts by supporting you as you develop your business models, as you build your commercialization plans. We want to facilitate market research and customer discovery, as you all know, understanding your customers, understanding those opportunities is central to your project. We also want to connect you with and help you pursue dilutive and non-dilutive capital. It's one of the things that the Entrepreneur Center, almost unique among the state of Ohio uh, venture development support organizations, really focuses on. And it's based on our years of support with the entrepreneur, uh, with the Air Force Research Labs. We work with small businesses around the country as they seek both dilutive sources of capital, think venture sources, angel investment sources but also non-dilutive sources of capital. So think small business innovative research grants from the Air Force, from the Army, from the Navy, wherever those federal resources might be, we help people go and pursue those and, and successfully uh, use those in their, development, uh, in their development of their technologies and in the development of their solutions. We also have extensive experience in sourcing and screening, managing student interns. So as Mark said, you've got a student experiential engagement opportunity we can help support that. Um, so we stand ready to join your teams and support your commercialization efforts in any way that might be valuable to you. Unless you think that we just wanna ride your coattails and join your uh, projects, we certainly wanna do that. We also wanna make sure that you understand we will bring cost match and resources to the engagement. So if we think about a typical engagement, 
let's just use for the sake of the discussion, $100,000 of commercialization work that you might do under an OFRN project. Again, just using that number as an example, we would support up to 50% of that or $50,000 of our resource to support you in match to the resource that you might bring from OFRN. So we are not looking to take money from your project unnecessarily. We're looking to add value to your project and we will bring resource directly to your project to support your efforts. Um, Paul Jackson from the Entrepreneur Center is gonna be joining us. He's on the call. If you are interested at all in engaging with us or if we can be helpful in any way, feel free to message Paul directly uh, and Paul's dropped that in the chat for you. Uh, but we do look forward to, if we can be at all valuable to you, we look forward to supporting any of your commercialization projects. Again, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Karen, Becky, and Emma for a few moments to address all of you. And we wish you the very best in your OFRN project. Excellent. Thanks so much, Scott. Appreciate it. I'll turn it back over to you. Sorry, I'll turn it back over to you, Mark. I just wanted to thank oh, Scott. <laughs> yep, you bet. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> um, Becky, if you could go to slide 25, please. There we go. Okay. So as I said, what we really want to do today is try to answer any questions that you have. Um, we do have subject matter experts that are on the line uh, for uh, areas of interest one, two, three, four, and six. Unfortunately, we don't have anybody uh, specifically today that is an expert that can answer your questions for commercial space and low earth orbit area of interest. Um, but we'd be happy to obviously take any questions that you might have on that particular AOI and then uh, we will post the answers on the website for you. So at this time, um, I will be happy to open it up. We can, you can either, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. Um, you can post your question in chat. You can raise your hand and uh, uh, we can come up on voice and ask your specific question. Um, or you can use, if you have uh, the one of the newer versions of Zoom, since we're using Zoom Gov, you may actually be able to see the Q&A icon at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen. Uh, feel free to use that uh, if as well, if you'd prefer uh, for you. Um, what The one question or the one uh, uh, thing that I would mention is um, that uh, you preface your question with the which area of interest uh, the question deals with. Uh, or if it's just a general question about the overall program, um, then uh, uh, obviously then Becky or, or hopefully I can maybe answer the question for you. So, um, and uh, we already, I see we had one question in the chat uh, from Andrew about the, um, the business proposal not being listed. Well, uh, it just so happens that, that it's because that is actually included in part of the cost proposal template. So if you open the cost proposal template, then you would see that the business proposal is part of that particular submission uh, for you. So hopefully that answered your question, Andrew. Okay, uh, any other questions? Again, raise a hand or feel free to uh, type them into the uh, the uh, the chat session or use the Q&A if you'd prefer. Any of those will work for us. We have a raised hand. Uh, is it Saeed? Hi, yes, that's right. Yeah, uh, I'm Said Farani, right. assistant professor uh, at uh, Cleveland State University. So, you know, we have a team interested about topic, uh, basically number four, digital engineering tools, mm -hmm. particularly the second subtopic, uh, oh. models of validation and assessment for digital maturity. So uh, we would like to know that uh, uh, who uh, would be the potential user of uh, this assessment tool and uh, digital maturity uh, software. Uh, Rick? I think, are you on? Uh, I'm here. Uh, hello, Saeed. Uh, yeah, um, our in-house teams at AFRL, specifically uh, in RQ, would be the potential users of the, any of the methods. 
that are de developed for uh, 4.2, over. Oh, okay. So, and then uh, what is the purpose of using this tool? Uh, basically, you are going to evaluate uh, Air Force, uh, you know, subcontractors and contractors in terms of their level of the maturity. Um, and then, you know, whether, you know, it is suitable to have some planning uh, and, you know, uh, improving uh, maturity level uh, uh, features in that tool as well. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer the, the question I heard, which was, how do we potentially use this tool? Exactly. So, yeah, so there, there is a uh, published set of Air Force digital maturity metrics that are out there. I've shared that with uh, OFRN. Uh, I don't know if they are able to uh, provide that to you, but you should be able to find uh, some similar documents on the web that describe what those maturity metrics look like. So really we're looking for a tool that will uh, allow us to uh, uh, perform an assessment of sets of digital artifacts, which have different levels of fidelity associated with them. I know that creeps a little bit into one, uh, 4.1, but yeah. 4.2 is about that those methods for establishing confidence in models and using that to demonstrate that you have a increase in digital maturity uh, by by the you know with the state you know to, to to quantify the state of the maturity of that artifact uh, when it's delivered through an in-house uh, or through a contracted activity. Do, does that help answer your question? Well. Uh... Yeah, to to some extent, uh, that that was uh, basically helpful. Um, but another thing is that see the digital maturity uh, assessment. It's a it's a very broad you know kind of uh, uh, topic, and uh, you know people are using that in terms of evaluating uh, like uh, uh, kind of different. Uh, a level of digital transformation in uh, companies, you know, especially in manufacturing companies. Uh, if you consider digital manufacturing or industry 4.0 readiness, so that would be one, uh, you know, uh, basically application of such kind of tools. Uh, as you said, there are possibility of using such digital maturity tools for assessing different technologies, you know, rather than assessing different organizations. So I would like to know uh, which direction would be closer to uh, AFRL, you know, uh, interest. Well, um, if you've, uh, I would review the Air Force digital maturity metrics okay. and the tool should be organized around the ability to apply those metrics easily with the methodology that you propose. Okay. Matrix. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. I'll, I will look for Air Force digital maturity matrix. So, so OFRN has a copy of the, oh, yeah. the uh, as a reference that they should be able to provide you. Sure. I will go ahead and ask for that reference. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Saeed. Uh, Becky, is that posted in the Q&A session or uh, the response area on the website? Um, no, it is not. Uh, are, can we, is it a distro A? Can we, can we publish it or is it something else? Um, I don't think I have um, a copy. I don't think I have a copy. I may have sent that to um, Karen. I let me check. So that was sent back around the first uh, Q and A session, right after right. we had right. our uh, proposal teams uh, discussion. 
Yeah, we, we've got yeah, that. We, Let me, Tim, I'll pull that up and Becky, I'll make sure you've got a copy. I, I thought we'd sent that on. So um, okay. let me double check, but I'll send that on. Okay, I have a note to follow up on it. Thank you. All right, well, we'll get that sorted out, um, Saeed, and get that on the website for you, um, hopefully um, later today or tomorrow at the latest, so you can take a look at it, so. Yeah, I, I would verify the distribution on that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have another uh, question. Uh, is it uh, Lee Wang? Yes. Hi, Mark. Hi. Uh, I have one question regarding the, you know, a 4.1. So I'm interested in working with uh, inertia data on this project. So one thing we want to know, like, is this 4.1 has to be specifically, you know, collaborating with uh, F, RL, or we can also work with NASA. Or is there a specific, you know, customer for this this digital tool, tool, or it can be applied for both Air Force and NASA? Yeah, uh, I'll let uh, Rick answer that question, um, and and then I'll sort of pitch in here too. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So obviously, there's there's interest in I think from both organizations. I mm -hmm. only speak for AFRL, but. When we put these topics together, uh, mm -hmm. it was with uh, uh, AFRL, NASA, uh, as well as NASIC uh, was mm -hmm. in the loop on that. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, you know, benefit to more than one organization, I, I think would be very, very uh, beneficial. Over. Okay, if we can find a partner in either Air Force or NASA, it should be fine, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, you you need you only need one um individual from one of those four different organizations that are willing to be a partner or a sponsor for you for the proposal uh however as rick mentioned and and i i was going to say almost the exact same thing is that if you feel like your proposal applies to multiple agencies then mm -hmm. make sure that you state that in the proposal and um and or you know you can use our team making a team matchmaking process on the website to um, to ask for somebody in say one of the other federal partner areas if they're interested in being a sponsor for you and then we can uh, run that down uh, for you uh, behind the scenes and let you know okay uh, also another thing is like for the federal partner do they need to provide a letter of support or something or it's not necessary as long as we identify the partner. You yeah, you just it. yeah you just need uh, to have um, spoken with somebody and allow, mm -hmm. and that they allow you to use their name and email address and contact information in your proposal. So you do not need a, a specific letter, um, you know, from the federal partner. But but mm -hmm. I, I will say, and only because you know we've had issues with this in past. Not that it would have anything to do with you, but, um, mm. you know, people will put names down on proposals and we double check that to make sure that those individuals, in fact, you know, have been contacted and that they are willing to be a sponsor for a project, <clears throat> excuse me, before we um, obviously move the project, the proposal yeah. on, so. Okay, sure, thank you. Yep, thank you. you bet. Uh, let's see, so I have a question in the chat, looks like from John, um, it says it's a general question and I'm getting feedback from somebody. It might, Rick, it might be from you. If you could mute, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, it says we will need involvement with, will we need involvement with the government sponsor as we prepare proposals or does that happen after the proposals are awarded? Um, so if I'm, John, if I'm understanding the question and you can feel free to come up on, uh, on audio if you'd like, is uh, as I was just mentioning um, to Lee is that you have to have uh, talked with a so one of our uh, federal sponsors and ha and they allow you to use their name and contact information as uh, a sponsor for the proposal. So I think the, quite, the answer would be yes, it has to be done before you submit the proposal. Is that what you're looking for there? Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. 
Okay, just wanted to make sure that I understood the the question um, correctly. So, so and and again, if you uh, you know, you may uh, only because I'm familiar with Radiance Technologies. So you may already have individuals at AFRL that you're working with, maybe in one of these specific AOIs or areas. Um, that is fine. You can use them as a sponsor for your proposal. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, say, one of the SMEs that's on the call today or that has been on a previous call. So, I, I, you know, we do recognize that there are a lot of small businesses around the state that work with uh, these federal partners on a somewhat regular basis. So if you have somebody that is a, uh, uh, you know, sort of a regular partner for you uh, there at AFRL or NASA or NASIC, uh, or NAMRA D, um, then, you know, you can use them at, on your proposal uh, for that. So, all right, uh, let's see. Any other questions? And Lee, do you have another question or or is your hand just still up? Yeah, I think my hand is still up. I okay. <laughs> thank you. Sure, thank you. Becky, am I missing anything? I am not seeing anything. Yeah, I don't see anything in the Q&A. This is highly unusual. Usually we have a ton of questions. Uh, well, Rick, you raised your hand, so I'll, for, I'll let you go. <laughs> yeah, I, so I sent a, a, a banking care, and I just uh, for, reforwarded you an email. So the uh, current uh, release of those uh, ma uh, maturity metrics, that is distro D, and it's owned by the um, AFMC Digital Transformation Office, but uh, you should have those POCs. Uh, um, it, it's unfortunate this is uh, the uh, April 17th before the 28th due date, but if team, if proposal teams have not seen these metrics yet, uh, they do need to, I've not been religiously following the, uh, the OFRN website to see what documents are being shared. But uh, you need to reach out to the DTO POC to get them to clear that uh, for release to distro A. Otherwise, uh, proposers would have to rely on their uh, uh, web searching uh, ability to find out more about metrics. And there is distro A material out there. Over. Great. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. Thank you, Rick. Um, Sai, did, did you have a follow up question? Yeah, so the question is that can we add any like a state consortiums uh, also as a partner to this proposal? You know, technically they are not like a industry partner or academia. Uh, they are a consortium, you know, kind of uh, uh, in a specific field. Sure. I don't um, obviously know, you know, specifically which one you might be referring to. Um, it, I would say that as long as you meet the minimum requirements that we talked about, um, the one industry partner and the two universities, um, that's fine. The um, you, you would just make sure that you outline in, you know, as much detail as necessary when it comes to your business proposal and your budgeting exactly how um the um the necessary funding would be distributed um i will say that uh there there may be some and uh i'm i'm not an, an expert in contracting law but there may be some individual rules when it comes to how state money can be um distributed uh, for instance, an example, and this isn't, I don't think it applies to what you're necessarily asking about, but like generally, you know, the state cannot supply funding to a federal agency that um, doesn't work that way. So um, you would, they, you know, the whoever, whoever is part of the consortium uh, would need to be, you know, state entities, essentially. So either business partners 
uh, for example, or other universities, um, those kinds of things, as long as they're they're public entities, then uh, generally state um, funding can be uh, distributed to those kind of partners. Yeah, uh, Peter, I can mention the name of that consortium. It's Northeast Ohio Cyber Consortium. Okay, yeah, I'm very familiar with uh, with them, so. So do you think that there shouldn't be any problem? I don't think so, but you might want to just double check all of the uh, members uh, mm -hmm. of the consortium um, just to make sure that there's not something, you know, tucked in there somewhere that might end up causing uh, you a problem a little later down the road. Okay. Uh, but as long as all the members, uh, at least well, all the members that I know of, but I don't know of every member of the consortium, but as long as all the members are business partners, um, uh, then you're probably okay. But again, um, uh, I, I don't know that for sure. I would, for you, I would definitely double check with um, the um, whoever the executive director is. And I know I've met him, but I can't think of his name right now off the top of my head. Yes. But Jeff, Jeff Brand. Yeah, thank you, Jeff Brancato. Yeah, yeah, I would check with Jeff, uh, obviously, um, before putting it in your proposal um, okay. that you're going to use or that they're one of your partners um, for funding. Now, if they're if they're just uh, advisor uh, for your proposal, then that's okay. Uh, it, okay. The problem only exists if if they're planning on getting uh, some of the funding, funding. from the state okay. of Ohio. Okay. So because we, we have had a number of individuals ask about, hey, can I have somebody, you know, like outside the state of Ohio or in another federal area, can I have somebody, you know, as a consultant or an advisor to my team? And the answer is sure, um, you know, uh, as long as we're not violating any rules as far as how the money is being spent um, oh. for that. Okay, thank you. Sure, you bet. Good. Uh, let's see, Becky, a Quick question there from Cynthia about table of contents. I'm sorry, it takes me a while to find my unmute button. Um, the table of contents, I am looking. Uh, I, I don't remember that the answer to that one right off the top of my head. Anyway, I will look it up and I will put it in the chat. The, the glossary as well? Uh, the glossary does count. Um, I believe the table of contents counts too. And I will look it up and put it in the chat. All right, thank you. I'll double check on that. Yeah. Okay, great. All righty. Uh, any other questions? Again, feel free to raise your hand uh, or use um, the chat or the Q&A function, which if you don't see the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen, the, there might be three ellipses uh, or three dots down there. You can try clicking on that. Sometimes the Q&A will be hidden in there as well. A lot of different versions of Zoom out there that everybody uses. And then uh, she, Cynthia uh, Becky was also asking about the um, page limit on the cost proposal. So you can, I'll let you answer that in the chat there while I continue to chat. Um, let's see. So, I haven't heard anybody asking any questions about hypersonics or human performance or high power energy conversion or quantum sensing technologies. So if there's anybody out there that is planning on submitting a proposal or thinking about submitting a proposal for any one of those areas of interest, I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions there. We do have some subject, subject matter experts from those particular areas that are still on the line. So please make sure you get your question answered or at least you get it submitted uh, today uh, or tomorrow at the latest. Uh, remember, I said 4 p.m. tomorrow is the cutoff for the questions. And we do that um, just in case you're wondering uh, so that we have time to be able to go back to our subject matter experts and get a 
um, detailed answer for you to the question, especially if the question is very technical in nature. We want to be able to make sure we have time to get that answer to you as quickly as we can with there still being a little bit of time left over before the proposal is um, due, obviously. Um, I don't think it would be helpful to everybody if we had this webinar and the proposal was due tomorrow or something like that, because the answer to your question may change the way that you end up putting your proposal together. So, and obviously we would like to see as many proposals as possible and hopefully as many successful proposals as possible. If I could clarify that, I we were just having trouble understanding which appendix is for which material because the resumes were mentioned in the uh, document itself, but it didn't say where to put them. Whereas the student experience was mentioned in the document itself, and 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 it stated put it in appendix one. Um, I could have sworn in the document that it was um, probably in the same spot. Uh, the uh we were wondering about the resumes that also goes in the appendix yeah but so which which appendix uh, it would be appendix let's see there two or three i mean there's only three that you can have So let's see, appendix one would be the student experiential engagement, mm -hmm. appendix two would be resumes, and appendix three would be letters of intent. Okay. In your proposal, your submission. Yes, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? We still have about 15 minutes left on today's information session. I'll ask one. Our uh, office sponsored programs asked if the te any template or the business and cost proposal templates can be altered. I'll turn that over to Becky. Uh, I guess. Uh, you can moderately alter them uh, to meet your needs. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if and you have I had that question this morning. I thought I had responded, and I will post it um, in the FAQ today. Thank you. Because I had a more detailed response. So. Great. Thanks, Becky. Appreciate it. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say if there was something that was very real specific, <clears throat> excuse me, that needed to be modified or changed somehow, we could always double check with our contracts folks too. <clears throat> yeah, I want to make sure that, you know, we maintain the uniformity of the data. Um, but I realize that, you know, organizations have different structures um, for some of the information that goes into the cost proposal. So I realize that, you know, you might have to modify a line here or there. Is it acceptable to um, use an appendix to include a published paper that has the details um, of the approach in the in the technical objectives? Uh, no, it is not. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to include the paper into your proposal, it would go into your page count. Um, however, if you go over your page count, usually the information that is over the eight page limit would be eliminated. Yeah, the paper won't fit in the page count. Yeah, no, I realize that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, John, you have a question. Yeah. The. Um... Proposal checklist in the business and cost proposal section it identifies a cost sharing section. Is there more information available somewhere to identify where that would um, to, to get more information for that, or do we work that out with our sponsor, or how do we explore that? Um, when you say more information on cost sharing, do you mean like 
definitions and examples? Well, who is who is available to, to share costs and what does that look like? How do we find current information about that? Okay, we have cost share guidelines in Appendix 3. And you can get that off of the website. Right, but who is available? I mean, who, who, how do we, is that all done within the team? Uh, cost sharing is done within the team and your subcontractors. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Lee, did you have another question? Yeah, I have another question regarding uh, still the same topic for point one. Mm -hmm. So we want to know, especially if uh, you know, we want to ask Rick, you know, uh, you know, is there a specific application of this, um, you know, surrogate modeling uh, for the Air Force, uh, like uh, you are interested in? You know, we, we do have an interest for, for apply, applying this, you know, digital twin surrogate modeling for like a NASA application for the lunar exploration, but I'm not sure for the Air Force, is there a specific application for your, you know, proposed, you know, this digital twin or uh, digital engineering solutions uh, for, yeah. Yes, we do have applications, but uh, this is um, your proposal needs to address a generic capability, and then we would uh, discuss potential um, uh, applications probably after contract award. Again, again we're mm -hmm. looking at applying it to some of our in-house programs, which are not uh, distro A. Okay. It should be like uh, generically apply to you know different applications of air force and nasa or something yes okay sure thank you uh, also can you left your email just in case we have some questions thank you thank you appreciate it john did you have a follow-up or uh, is your hand just still happen to be up? Just checking. Oh, it went down. Oh, my bad. Apologies. <laughs> no, no problem. Thanks. Okay. Uh, questions. Again, any any questions on any of the other areas of interest? I know there's been a lot of discussion uh, on previous webinars. Don't hear anything or see anything right now. I'm about 10 more minutes. Um, uh, Mark, if there's yes. time, I would like to ask another question. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Regarding uh, topic 4.2, uh, uh, see, part of this proposal preparation is the uh, commercialization plan and that uh, business plan. So I would like to know that uh, if we uh, propose developing a tool for uh, assessing uh, digital maturity, uh, then uh, if the potential user is AFRL, so how would be the process of commercializing? If no, we are developing a tool for, um, you know, Air Force contractors, then uh, that it, that would be different, you know, basically, or or the interest of the uh, Air Force is that we provide that tool uh, for public, you know, that they can use it to assess their um, basically the maturity of their technology, the digital maturity of their technology or uh, their organization, uh, and then we follow. Uh, the commercialization and basically the business plan through um, providing additional support and consultation or 
uh, more advanced, uh, you know, version of basically uh, more advanced level of using that software. You know, just to imagine, for example, we have many tools, many software that uh, the basic use of that software is free. But if you want to use that uh, as a professional uh, application in a professional application or a commercial application or in an advanced level, then you need to uh, pay for the licensing. You know. Right. I don't, uh, Rick, I don't know if, I guess, if you have a particular comment here for this, I, I would say that, you know, one of the things that the Ohio Federal Research Network has always tried to, to promote, um, and many of the uh, federal entities that participate in the SBR and STTR programs do as well, is this concept of dual use. So, you know, developing some type of technology that can both be used by one of the departments um, or federal agency and uh, has a commercial application to it that can be commercialized and marketed after the fact as well. Um, uh, in part, uh, you know, that is why this program is unclassified, of course, you know, um, is because the intent is that at the end of the contract award period, 18 months approximately, um, that, uh, you know, working with other organizations, for example, the Entrepreneur Center um, that Scott talked about earlier, is that you would take the, whatever the technology is that you have, or application that you have developed, your federal partner is then going to use that to continue on the work that they're doing. And then at the same time, you'll be able to um, work on commercializing uh, that product to be able to license and sell, obviously, uh, to the public. So I, I don't, Rick, I don't know if, it, I'm not sure if I actually answered your question, Saeed, but that was kind of the way I understood it. I don't, Rick, do you have any other comments? Yeah, yeah, I can add a couple couple things. I mean, obviously, any, any type of software you develop, uh, you know, the Air Force, uh, some people will say we're in the business of buying uh, other people's software tools, which is true although we do develop our own in-house software. But in terms of commercialization, you know, without getting too specific as to what you might wanna put into your proposal, we do have uh, you know, isolated networks uh, that we, you know, uh, I use every day to install commercially uh, you know, available software. We also, for digital engineering, are going toward developing our own um, what I call a you know integrated digital environment. So the software tools need to be able to run uh, both on like a in a desktop um, you know isolated uh, network infrastructure, especially you know, uh, if we want to use a commercial tool that would run on something like a classified computing network, we would need to have that ability there to buy uh, isolated licenses. But these integrated digital environments are cloud uh, hosted uh, digital collaboration spaces. And for software in section four, if there's any software there that does get a new contract award, uh, I would be able to, to connect uh, teams to uh, the, the uh, owners and maintainers of our um, cloud enabled uh, integrated digital environments to make sure that the requirements during software development you know, are, are appropriately addressed. So the idea there is to make the uh, desktop to cloud enabled um, hosting of the, uh, the, you know, the new software tool. We wanna make that easy uh, to deploy into these integrated digital environments. Over. Okay, thank you. Thank you, it was helpful. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. A couple minutes left. Any uh, any other questions? I don't see anything right now in the chat or Q&A. I think one just came in from Cindy in the chat, Mark. Oh, yes. Thank you. 
Uh, are small businesses permitted to include fee or profit in their cost proposal as they are with federal contracts and grants? Becky, I'll let you answer that one. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the answer is no. Um, this is a cost reimbursable contract. And Jill, I think, yeah, Jill Richards is on the call here. So Jill, would you like to chime in on that? I am on the call. Um, yeah, if it's cost reimbursable, then there would be no, um, no fee allowed. Great, thanks, Jill, appreciate it. Okay, uh, any other questions? Again, uh, just as a uh, reminder, and actually maybe for the last couple of minutes here, um, Becky, if you wanna slide down to 28, slide 28. Right there. Uh, just as a reminder, tomorrow um, afternoon at four o'clock, um, any questions? Is the cutoff for any questions to be submitted through the website? And the round six solicitation is due at 5 p.m. Eastern time on April the 28th. So, what, 11 days from today. So, Mark, can the uh, discussions with the uh, federal partners continue until the deadline on the Absolutely. 28th? Absolutely. Yes. Yep. So the yeah, one thing I can find on the website that I would be interested in, is there a um, maybe broken down by AOR? Is there a listing of the uh, which government uh, SMEs are able to bring uh, money to the table? I understand it's not required, but I was just curious if the, you know, just to, so I could say, go back to my organization and say, you know, look, the guys over in quantum sensing are bringing t uh, matching funds to the table. Uh, if I like to communicate that to my leadership, that'd be uh, interesting to know by AOR topic, if there was additional mon matching money there over. Yeah, no, that's a great point, Rick. And I, uh, to the best of my recollection, I don't think that is something that we have included uh, up front previously um, with this. I don't, Becky, do you remember? Um, I can't remember anything like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, that is that is great. And we would love um, if there are any of our federal partners um, do have any kind of um, matching fund or um, follow on potential funding, um, understand how difficult it is to necessarily look out a couple of years in the future uh, with the way the budgeting system works. But, um, you know, the, uh, what we run into a lot of times is as the teams proceed, the ones that are awarded contracts as they proceed through the contract, is we work very hard to try to find additional funding for that team once the, the OFRN contract expires, that they can continue on uh, collaborating with uh, the federal partner uh, and or um, uh, through other types of uh, funding instruments that are available um, in the federal government or DOD uh, for that matter. So, um, yep. all right, thank you. Yeah, that's, but that's a great, that's a great uh, comment. I mean, uh, for all of our federal partners, our SMEs that are listening, you know, uh, feel free to talk amongst yourselves or with your other partners that are within the different areas of interest. And if that is something that you're willing to offer up, uh, let Becky um, or I know, and we can make sure that we get it on the website anyways, under the, um, the frequently asked questions section of the, of the uh, website for round six. Okay, I think we're pretty much at the end of the time period. Um, I wanna just thank again, all of our federal partners, our SMEs for their time today. Know how busy you all are. And uh, thank you so much for being willing to uh, collaborate with uh, us at the Ohio Federal Research Network and be able to get this uh, round six solicitation out there and hopefully get everybody's questions answered. Uh, Karen, 
or Becky, any uh, comments? Um, just thank you to everyone for uh, all your questions. And I will be doing a post uh, later today with some recent FAQs. Excellent. And I don't know if Karen is still on. She may mm -hmm. not be. She had to jump off. Yeah, I think she's probably jumped off. So, all right. Um, well, um, thank you again very much. We really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we got the majority of your questions answered. And we'll look forward to reading some of your proposals here in about two weeks. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great day.